I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and hotties. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Hello. <laughs> Little Miss Honey, how are you today? I'm fine. That's fine. I'm fine, too. That's fine. Sounds like this is going to be a fine time. <laughs> it will be if you have a fine joke. In the comics, we should find one. <laughs> Goody, please read me the funny. Puck the comic weekly. Yes. I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And at the top of the first page, there's little old Snookum. Yes, but could we turn over the page to Flash Gordon? It's so exciting, I just can't wait. Why, sure we can, because Zarkov, Flash's friend, has come in the rocket ships from Mongo. Just in time to save Flash. Uh-huh. And Zinn had escaped with a machine by which he controls the zombies. And they were just about to overpower Flash when Zarkov came. Well, I wonder whether Flash and Zarkov will capture Zinn now, so let's please read. Since you said please, we will read Flash Gordon. Riga riga doon doon, Saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. Zarkov has seen Flash on the ground below and has landed his rocket ship to pick him up. Safe behind a ring of flame, Flash helps the rebellious Rubia into the rocket ship. Flash laughs. Zarkov, old man, you landed just in time. Zin's zombies nearly got us. Quickly, they take off. They zoom to the volcano crater where Dale was hiding. As Flash steps out of the ship, Dale throws her arms around him, almost weeping with joy. She tells him she was afraid he was caught in the fire caused by the bombs dropped by Zarkov. Flash chuckles. Well, I did have a pretty hot time of it. Dale then sees Rubia, whom Flash has brought along. She asks what she's doing here. Rubia answers that Flash just couldn't bear to lose her, which makes Dale jealous. When Flash sees the two women beginning to argue, he frowns last picture top row... We've no time for such nonsense. Our job is to catch Zinn. And to get in the ship and take off. But the crafty Zinn, first picture, bottom row, is too deeply hidden inside the moon to be found. He controls his slave army through the auto brain, thinking for them, even seeing through their eyes when he chooses. He sneers to himself. <laughs> Flash, you're searching in the wrong place. And then he sees that Flash is raiding his laboratory. But instead of preventing the men he controls with the machine from going within range of the dropping bombs, Zinn, reckless of human life, sends his robots to certain doom directly into the area where the bombs are dropping, hoping that one man will live long enough to get to Flash. But Flash from above in his rocket ship sees the poor men marching into the area and being killed, and he orders... Don't shoot the poor fellows. We'll use coma smoke. Does that mean that he's not going to drop any more bombs? That's right. Instead, he's going to use coma smoke, which the robots will inhale, and it'll put them into a sleep, which is a coma. Oh, oh, that's very nice of Flash. Yes, that's what I thought, too. Well, I wish he could find where Zinn is hiding and, and get him so, so no more of those men will be killed. Well, let's hope they find him next week. Well, now, how would you like to read Dick's adventures? Oh, I'd love to, because Dick has been with Paul Revere in the early days of America. And remember last week, he and Paul Revere made a fast ride on horseback to a town called Lexington. And do you remember they were yelling, the British are coming, the British are coming, and, and the people got out of bed in their nightshirts. Yes, and right in the middle of this dream, Dick woke up. Well, maybe you'll go to sleep again and have another exciting dream. So let's read because they're so exciting. Well, let's find out now. So here we go on page three with Dick's Adventures in Dreamland. And say the magic words with me. rickety pack a zack a zick Let's have music for adventurous Dick. It's nighttime, and Dick is falling asleep. His father hears him mumbling and says, I thought I just heard him say George Washington. 
And then Dick drops off to sleep. And in his dreams, he goes back, back. And he finds himself knocking on a door. The servant opens it. And in answer to Dick's question, the servant says, oh, Yes, sir, young gentleman. This is the George Washington plantation. Any name to give Mr. Washington? Uh, tell him, please, I was just sent down to Virginia from Massachusetts with some very important news. Dick is led into the house and meets the great man himself. And last picture, top row, is telling George Washington, Sir, the British regulars and the American Minutemen have fought their first battle. It started in Lexington on the 19th of April. And as Dick tells the story, George Washington sees it in his own mind, just as we see it in the pictures in the second row. The Redcoats marched up from Boston to arrest John Hancock and Sam Adams and Concord and to seize powder and bullets. But Paul Revere rode ahead and warned everyone. And the Minutemen were waiting in Lexington, and they were shot down. And at Concord Bridge, there was another battle. But the British were too late to catch Hancock or Adams, and most of the powder and bullets were used on them. And then they started back for Boston. And he goes on, first picture, bottom row. And the news spread like wildfire. Bells were ringing everywhere. Farmers left their fields and workmen left their benches. And they came with their guns and blasted the redcoats from behind every tree and stone wall. And they cut them to pieces. And as Dick finishes telling his story, the servant comes into the room, followed by a tall, distinguished-looking man. The servant announces... Mr. Thomas Jefferson to see you, sir. And as Dick sees the great Thomas Jefferson, the man who wrote the Constitution of the United States, one of America's greatest patriots, he exclaims, Gosh! Oh, wasn't that exciting? The Americans chased the British back. Very exciting, because the Americans were only farmers and the British were a large army. Yes. I wonder what Thomas Jefferson has come to see George Washington about. Next week, we'll find out. Oh, I can hardly wait. You know, there's so many famous men in this story. There's Paul Revere and George Washington and Thomas Jefferson. I wonder who else will be in this story. Well, if you'll be here every Sunday, maybe we'll find out. Oh, I certainly will. Oh, look, here's Rusty Riley right below Dick's adventure. Yes, he's back home safe and sound again after his exciting adventure, and he and Tex are talking about it. Oh, I'd like to hear what they're saying, so please read. All right. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Tex and Rusty are sitting out in the barn in the tack room, which is where they keep the saddles and things. And Rusty is saying, Golly, Tex, it's sure good to be back here after that awful night in the quarry. Well, I thought Hill Billy and I were done for. Yeah, that sure was a rugged experience, Rusty. But it was right smart of you to notice them low-flying planes. You know, that's how we located you. Hmm. Well, by the way, how'd the police happen to arrive just at the right time? Well, that was a surprise to Mr. Miles and me, too, Rusty. They just got curious when they heard where we were heading. Turned out lucky for them as well as for us. That hombre with the mustache is known as Blackie, a man they've wanted for a year. At this moment, Mr. Miles comes into the barn and says... Oh, uh, Tex, I'm glad I caught you in. And uh, you too, Rusty. I have some business to attend to up in New England, so I'm going to open the old house on the coast. You and I will go there right after the Selby Cup race. Well, how about Patty and me? Are we going to go too? Mr. Miles replies, last picture, top row. Yes, yes, Rusty, we'll be there quite a while. So I've wired to have a tutor for you two youngsters. Right, boss. So we better send Jimmy up to get the stable ready. First picture next row. As Rusty's packing, he asks his little friend, Patty, hey, have you ever been up there, Patty? Where is it? Patty tells him that it's a wonderful place called Shark's Neck and that he'll just love it, that there are boats and fishing and everything. Rusty's eyes light up at the thought of going to this wonderful place. <laughs> Meanwhile, many miles away, on the New England coast, a cantankerous-looking old man called the squire is reading the telegram he has received from Mr. Miles announcing that they're coming. And he says to himself, Hmm, this telegram for Miles poses a bit of a problem. I might even say nuisance. Well, I better talk this over with the captain. Last picture, he's down by the boatyard talking to a bearded old fellow who's a sea captain, saying... Captain, 
I have some disturbing news. Quentin Miles is coming up to occupy his house on Shark's Neck. This is a severe blow to our uh, activities. The captain thinks for a second, then replies, Well, Squire, it's true it has the only safe beach on the neck, but with a little care, we ought to be able to keep on without too much danger. <laughs> We ought to be able to keep on without too much danger. I think they don't want anybody to know what they're doing. Oh, do you think they're doing something bad? I really think so. And Mr. Miles and Tex and Rusty are coming there? Yes. Uh-oh, more trouble. I'm afraid so. And I think we'll find out something about it next week. Goody, now can we find out what's happening with Roy Rogers? He's in trouble, too. Yes, you bet he is. He was on his way to help a friend of his. And then he saw some wild horses running away, and he saw a man who was going to shoot one of them. And Roy jerked the gun right out of his hand. Then a minute later, another of the crooks had flicked the lasso over Roy's head, and Roy found himself tied up. So let's find out what the crooks are going to do to Roy. All right, turn over the page. And there on the top of page five is Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. A yip hi Now here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip hi His hands bound behind him, Roy watches as Beaker, one of the crooks, lassoes one of the wild horses, snags the rope around a tree and holds the horse steady while he says, All right, splice the lariats together, Shorty. This wild Mustang's gonna give Rogers a joyride. Shorty, Beaker's Mexican helper, ties Roy's feet to the end of the rope around the wild horse's neck, saying, This will teach you to mind your own business for good. And they let the wild horse go, last picture top row. And he gallops off, dragging Roy on the ground behind him. Shorty shouts first picture next row. So long, Rogers. Watch out for the high spots. Ha! As the horse that is dragging Roy goes out of sight down the canyon, Beaker and Shorty mount their horses. Beaker says, third picture, second row. All right, let's get back to trailing that critter. We got to get him before Chubby Walton does. Meanwhile, last picture of the row, Roy shouts to Trigger, who has followed the wild horse dragging him. Stop him, Trigger, quick! Force him into the canyon wall. Trigger gallops up and forces the horse against the canyon wall, stopping the horse. First picture, bottom row, Roy calls. Keep him busy until I get myself loose, Trigger boy. Quickly, Roy unties himself. The wild horse quiets down, and Roy climbs in the saddle and continues on his way, last picture, saying, I aim to get even with those two pole cats, Trigger, but first we gotta find Chubby Walden. Suddenly, from some bushes off the road, there's a cry. Oh, oh. Roy exclaims, what's that? He reins in Trigger and wonders whether this is a trick or if someone is really in danger. <laughs> It's someone in trouble? I'm afraid the only thing to do is to wait until next week to find out. Well, I hope that next week Roy does catch those two crooks and just fixes them good for what they did to him. I feel the same way, and I think he will. Good. Now, how would you like to read Donald Duck? Oh, I just love it, please. Very well, then. Turn over the page, and there in the middle of page seven, under Barney Google and Snuffy Smith, is Donald Duckle, and I'll read him in just a moment. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And in the middle of page seven of the first section is Donald Duckle. Good for a chuckle. Say the magic words for the music with me. Squeeze him, squeeze him, chiddly chit chat. Let's have music to fit a quack quack. Donald turns on the radio and a voice comes out. And now, Aunt Fanny's personal problems hour. Donald smiles and settles himself down to enjoy Aunt Fanny's personal problems. Well, good afternoon, folks. This is Aunt Fanny, all ready to solve your problems. And the first letter is from a young lady. Donald smiles and says, Ah, a young lady. And listens as Aunt Fanny reads the young lady's letter. Dear Aunt Fanny, my boyfriend is so stingy, he only takes me to the cheapest places. I'm desperate, Aunt Fanny. What shall I do? Signed, Daisy. Last picture, top row, Donald exclaims, The rotter. Then first picture, bottom row, his eyes pop together, and he exclaims, Daisy, Daisy. <laughs> and he realizes that the letter is from his girlfriend, Daisy, that she's complained about him to Aunt Fanny. And he listens as Aunt Fanny answers Daisy's letter. Dear 
Daisy on your next date, wear your oldest, most ragged clothes, and he'll get the idea. Donald smiles to himself. So, a trick, huh? A female conspiracy, huh? Well, we'll see about that. And in a minute, with a trick of his own in mind, Donald has Daisy on the phone and is asking her, Like to step out for chow tonight with me tonight, Daisy? Daisy replies, Oh, I'd love to. <laughs> Last picture, Donald dressed in his very best clothes, and Daisy dressed in her very worst clothes, <laughs> enter a beautiful high-class nightclub. Donald looks very pleased with himself, and Daisy looks very unhappy with herself. <laughs> what a frog. And when the waiter sees Daisy, he looks just like this. <laughs> to take her into a nice place when she was dressed in old clothes. Well, I think it was mean of Daisy to wear old clothes when she was going out with Donald. Yes, but Donald had always taken her to cheap places. And when a man... Uh, should we read... Well, when a man takes the should girl... Should we read Blondie? Well, when a man takes the girl to a cheap place... Very well, then we won't read Blondie. Oh, oh I love to have you read Blondie. Oh, you changed your mind, no, huh? No, no, I always love to have you read Dagwood and Blondie, and I know where to find them. Just pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. Well, since you have it all spread out, I shall read Dagwood and Blondie. Ramafoo, ramafum, zim, zam, zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Herb Woodley's wife in her bathrobe has come over to Blondie's house and she tells Blondie that Herb is working late and she's scared to death in their house all by herself. Blondie says... Oh, you're welcome to sleep here, Tootsie. And upstairs they go. Blondie routes Dagwood out of bed and tells him... Dagwood, you go downstairs and sleep on the sofa so Mrs. Woodley can sleep with me. Dagwood climbs out of bed and goes downstairs. <laughs> Last picture, top row. Dagwood settles down on the sofa. And he yells, Yo! Oh! The spring in this sofa is broken. It's cutting me to pieces. First picture, next row. Tootsie Woodley hands Dagwood a key, saying, Well, here's our key, Dagwood. Go next door and sleep in our bed. A little later, Herb Woodley comes home, saying, Oh, man, I'm tired tonight. It's going to be good to get some sleep. He goes right upstairs. Comes into the bedroom, turns on the light, and looks at the bed. And his hat pops off his head. He exclaims, Dagwood. And Dagwood says sweetly, Oh, yeah, your wife is sleeping over at our house with Blondie. By the time that Herb has gotten his pajamas on, Dagwood is sound asleep, making a terrible racket. Herb says angrily as he looks at Dagwood, I can't sleep with all that snoring. I'll go over to his house and sleep on his sofa. Over at Dagwood's house, Blondie and Tootsie, who have let Herb in, watch him as he settles down on the sofa. Blondie tells him... Herb, but you can't sleep on that sofa. It's broken. Oh, you're telling me. But Blondie solves the problem by saying... I, I'll go over to your house and sleep with Dagwood, and you two can sleep in our bed. <laughs> But first picture, bottom row. No sooner have Herb and Tootsie settled down in bed, in Dagwood and Blondie's bed, than the five pups come into the room. Herb says, uh-oh, their pups are surprised to see us in Bombstead's bed. Suddenly, the dogs begin to howl. Last picture, Dagwood and Blondie stick their head out of Herb's window and yell, shut those dogs up or I'll call the police. Herb and Tootsie stick their heads out of Dagwood's window and shout, they're your pups. And the pups stick their heads out of the window and howl and howl. <laughs> Wasn't that funny? Everybody was getting in and out of bed and sofas, and, and then they finally end up with Dagwood and Blondie in Herb's house, and Herb and Tootsie in Dagwood's house. <laughs> I think that's so funny. Yes, it certainly is. Well, now, how would you like to hear Uncle Remus and his tales of Bear Rabbit? Oh, oh I'd just love to. Well, goody, turn over the page past Jungle Jim and to the top of page three, and here we go with Uncle Remus and his tales of Bear Rabbit. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity make, make it a habit to give us music for old Br Br Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, One time Br'er Coon's store was robbed, but the only clue was some great big footprints. Yes, Br'er Coon's store had been robbed, and right out in front, leading away from the open door, are big footprints in the mud. 
Brer Coon is telling the sheriff and Brer Rabbit. Yeah, he busted in during the night, but he only took sweet stuff, candy and sugar. The sheriff looks to where the footprints lead and says, Hmm, and the footprints stop at the edge of the brush. Brer Rabbit scratches his head thoughtfully as he looks at the prints and says, Now who can you wear shoes that big? Hmm, and he thinks and thinks. <laughs> Somewhat later, Br'er Rabbit is out in the woods talking to two little lizards, and he's saying, All I ask you to do, Br'er Lizards, is to scout through the brush around here and see if you can find a pair of big boots. And Br'er Lizard replies, Well, I, I, I think I know where them boots is. And they point over in the bush. And Br'er Rabbit looks in the bush, and sure enough, he sees two big shoes under the bush. And as he takes them out, one lizard says, ah, we, 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 we see them here this, this morning. And lizard number two says, yeah, but, 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 but who do they belong to? And Br'er Rabbit replies, I think I know who. And then Br'er Rabbit has an idea. And by the time we skip to the next picture, Br'er Rabbit has given the two little lizards some instructions. And he's putting one shoe on one lizard's back and the other shoe on the other lizard's back. And Br'er Rabbit says, Now you two boys do just like I told you. No matter where he goes, you just keep following him. And lizard number one says, yeah, 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 You just sit back and do the looking. And lizard number two says, Yeah, be, 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 let's go. And down the road, the two lizards go, carrying the shoes on their backs. Of course, the shoes are so big, you can't see the lizards under them. So it looks like the shoes are traveling along all by themselves, which, of course, is a very strange sight to see. First picture, bottom row, the two shoes come traveling down the road toward Br'er Bear, who is sitting on a log surrounded by cans of sugar and honey and candy, which he's stolen from the store. All of a sudden, Br'er Bear sees the boots coming toward him. He exclaims, But the boots, the, them boots, there's walking and I ain't in them. And he gets to his feet and runs off down the road, hollering, The, they is chasing me. The, help, help. The, they's got ghosts in them. I <laughs> confess it. I took them sweets, though. Save me from them boots. The last picture, he runs right into town and skitters up a lamppost. So scared is he. Br'er Rabbit lifts the two shoes off the two lizards and says to Br'er Bear, Br'er Bear, you tripped up on your own boots. And Br'er Bear replies, Duh, I has been tricked. And Uncle Remus says, Guilty conscience runs for confession. <laughs> Wasn't that a funny look on Br'er Bear's face? When he saw the two lizards coming toward him. <laughs> well, it certainly was, and I'm afraid Br'er Bear's conscience got the best of him. Oh, I'm afraid so, too. I knew he was guilty. Well, now I'm afraid I'll be guilty if I don't read Prince Valiant to you. Yes, you certainly will be. Very well, then, turn over the page. Go past the Comic Weekly Club, which I'm sure you follow every day. Oh, yes, in the daily newspaper, besides the Sunday paper. And go past the Lone Ranger, across the page, past Little Eye. Oh, you, you don't have to turn all these pages. You just go to the right to the last page. That's where Prince Valiant is. Oh, yes, and here we are on the last page of the second section with Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Hackett, Breckett, Gray Malkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> After his battle with the bandits, in which he gave him a good whipping and set fire to their fort, Val meets some of the countrymen, good people who lead him to a ruined castle where a little old ball-headed man is found. His name is Sieur de Luc, who says... Uh, pardon the slight untidiness of my house, good sirs. I am seeking control of a monster who is boisterous at times. Val looks at his small, hairless host. So this is the man those stalwart yeomen love and hold in such great respect. Sir DeLuke invites Val and his men to dinner. And last picture top row, they dine in an unruined corner of the castle. Sir DeLuke tells him, I am preoccupied with science, so I divided my land among my men and let them govern it in council. Uh, they do it better than I can. Uh, we all have greater freedom for our work. And he goes on, first picture, second row. I uh, have a formula for arousing the energies of a genie. But uh, so far, I have found no means of controlling him. Uh, oh, come, come, I will show you. So they rise from the table and go to the center of the room, where there's a hole in the floor. The Sir de Luc tells him, Into this hole... I placed the blood of a black rooster, so, a toad, so, and a broken wine jar, so. Uh, uh, now, on top of this, a bag of my secret powder. And then, chanting the magic words, Ooh, 
botheration. I roll in a red hot stone. They all look at the hole in the ground, wondering what the magic genie within will do. Suddenly, last picture of the row, the genie gives forth an ear-shattering roar, and an arm of flame hurls the stone skyward. There's an explosion as the stone shoots up. Everyone runs to hide, and a second later, the stone drops again on a table. So... The Sir de Luke stands with folded hands, looking about him with a serene look on his face. First picture, bottom row. Val gets to his feet. But it takes much longer to get Eagle, Rufus, and Young Arf to return from their hiding places where they had run in such a hurry. Last picture, as Val looks at the strange little man in amazement, the Sir de Luke thumbs through a book as he looks at the castle, which he has ruined by his experiments, and he says, I am slowly reducing the formula. Next time, I shall leave out the toad. <laughs> What do you think of that? What do I think? I think he must be crazy. Look at that place. It's a mess. Yes, it is. A mess. Do you, do you think it will help any to leave out the toad? No, the toad won't do any good at all because the toad isn't causing any of that trouble. Well, then, why does he use it? Well, in the old days, people used to believe superstitious things, that by mixing up such things as toads and the blood of roosters and mumbling strange words that they could perform magic, but it never happened. No. Then what caused the explosion? Well, if you come next week, you'll find out. Oh, I'll be here. Fine. Now, that's all the time I have. But before I go, here's that nice fellow with some more interesting information. Well, honey, and all your boys and girls, I've got to go now. All right, Mr. Tonic Bigby Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date. And a date with all your boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend, Miss Honey, next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. <laughs>